Bond is in the and you've got Neil on half here, got Sleepwees, the back end of the car got loose. He's got it, Sleepwees again, he's trying to regain control. And Earnhardt loses it, goes on the grass, comes back, and uh, Elliott goes inside. And Earnhardt still got the lead, incredible. And for the first time in his NASCAR Winston Cup career, Mean to really turn around, mean to rattle his cage, though. Here comes Earnhardt. How did he get through all these cars? I don't understand how he did that. The Intimidator is scraped and beat on the right side. But he will not be denied. The no ball five contender, Mr. Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt, comes down and will take his tip. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of splendid torch, which I get a hold of for the moment. And I want it to burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins. The words you just heard were penned by George Bernard Shaw. The shining light that was the life of Dale Earnhardt burned brilliantly. On Sunday, less than a mile from the checkered flag of the Daytona 500, that light was extinguished in a racing accident that has stunned us all. The void that has opened is deep. We hope in the next hour that our remembrances of Dale will bring some comfort to the millions of fans that are hurting along with us. The time to address the hows and whys of the accident will come, but not for now. We need to share in a celebration of the life of this American icon. Joining me here in our studio is Dr. Jerry Punch, a close friend to the Earnhardts, and certainly a man who knew Dale as well as anyone. Jerry? Bob, you know, Dale Earnhardt's celebrity extended far beyond the realm of stock car racing. As you said, he was an American icon. He was a hero's hero. And for those of you not familiar with motorsports or not even a casual motorsports fan, Look at it this way, Dale Earnhardt was Elvis and all four Beatles. And tonight, millions of people all over this country are shocked and stunned because he is gone. Emails, thousands by the thousand, have been sent into ESPN and every media outlet around the country trying to remember the fallen hero. And over the past couple of nights, hundreds have filed by the Earnhardt estate, leaving flowers and pictures and their special remembrances. The florists around Kannapolis, North Carolina and Mooresville, North Carolina have said their phones have been ringing off the hook and every phone call begins the same way, sobbing and tears and finally they gather it up enough to be able to place an order. Today when I got on an airplane to come here to do this special tonight, I looked around the airport and there sat people with Earnhardt jackets and hats and shirts and they all did the same thing. They all leaned forward and had their face buried in their hands. Tonight, a nation grieves for a fallen hero. Last year at Atlanta, when ESPN closed our 20-year ride with NASCAR, I thought I had done my final Winston Cup-related broadcast with Benny Parsons. Now with this most tragic of occurrences, it's a time for families to come back together. Joining us now from Daytona Beach is our friend and colleague who spent many a Sunday afternoon racing with and marveling at Dale Earnhardt. Bob, in the mid-80s, I was so envious of Dale Earnhardt. He had it all, winning races, winning championships, and the fans just, just... He had hordes and hordes of fans. When he was introduced at the racetrack, it seemed like everybody in the grandstands stood up and cheered. Meanwhile, when I was introduced, just a smattering of applause from the grandstands. But Earnhardt winning those championships, winning races, 
and they were on top of the world. He could do no wrong. And I think all race car drivers have to be a little bit envious of that because that's what we're all trying to do is go out there and do exactly what he was doing. Envious in a positive way, though, and there are thousands of young men and women who are either just beginning to drive race cars or who will someday that want to be just like Dale Earnhardt. Exactly, Bob. Everyone who drove with Dale Earnhardt respected him, but what you wanted was his respect, and you wanted to, to wait till that race was over, and when Dale Earnhardt came up behind you, if he gave you that little tap, that was the Dale Earnhardt bump of approval. That's when you knew you had finally arrived because you had earned the respect of the Intimidator. Well, from motorsports capitals like Indianapolis, Charlotte, and Daytona to rural communities across America, fans have spent the past two days pouring out their emotion with personal tributes. The impact of Dale Earnhardt's death has touched everyone in the racing community. associated with Dale Earnhardt's passing is beyond immediate comprehension. The fact that his fatal accident would occur at Daytona in a race that he loved dearly is difficult to fathom. Let's reflect on this same week three years ago. Dale's 19-year winless relationship with the sport's biggest race had reached a boiling point heading into the 1998 Daytona 500, which also kicked off NASCAR's 50th anniversary season. In the 50 years of NASCAR, what would you want to accomplish? Well, if you was involved all that time. Well, sure, you'd want to win a championship, but you'd want to win the Daytona 500, too, wouldn't you? <laughs> We've never won it, so. We've been so close and so competitive there with uh, Richard and the team, and uh, it's just been an awesome kind of race to work toward and be a part of and be in. And to not ever win it is really, you know, it's, it's a tough deal, but still, it's not the only deal in my life, like I said. I mean, there's, there's, there's hurdles you get over and there's some you don't, and if you don't, you just keep trying till you do. 20 years of trying, 20 years of frustration. Dale Earnhardt will come with a caution flag to win the Daytona 500. Finally, the most anticipated moment in racing. For Dale Earnhardt, his trip down pit road following his Daytona 500 win was sweet indeed. We can only imagine what flood of emotion filled his eyes of steel as the racing world paid tribute. After 19 bitter trips to Daytona for NASCAR's biggest race, this trip to Victory Lane had been paved with past heartbreak. It wasn't as if he didn't already know the way. He had visited Stock Car Racing's most sacred spot, Daytona Speedway's Victory Lane, 30 times before. But those trips followed triumphs in events like the Bud Shootout, the International Race of Champions, or in the Bush Series. He was a permanent fixture for the Gatorade Twin 125 qualifying races, winning a remarkable 10 times in a row. He had even won in the summer heat, capturing two Pepsi 400s. But everyone knows, most of all Dale, that is not winning the Daytona 500. From his first Daytona 500 start in 1979, he always knew his way to the front. Leading laps in the Daytona 500 came natural to Dale, as did late race heartbreaks. Earnhardt's car blows up! Earnhardt Derek. blows the tire in turn number three! Derek Culp down to the inside, Terry Labonte second, as Dale Earnhardt slides back into the fourth position. Off the corner, it's Derek Culp! But here comes Terry Labonte, he looks to the inside, Derek Culp covers the spot. Earnhardt's not a factor here. Culp, hold off the challenge of Labonte, Derek Culp wins the Daytona 500 in a remarkable upset here at the World Center of Racing. Year after year, he would fall short, and always left to answer the tough questions. It's the Daytona 500, I ain't supposed to win the damn thing. Right? <laughs> Tenacity isn't a strong enough word to describe his will to win the Daytona 500 as he gave evidence to, even in the most extreme circumstances. When the victory finally came following another dominating performance, the emotions were as genuine as any ever witnessed in sport. The Intimidator had conquered his greatest rival and given his fans a triumph that will never be forgotten. That last shot there with the fans was taken long after the checkered flag dropped. There's always the obligatory interview in the media center, and Dale showed up a lot of emotion there and really 
made the most of his win. He did, Bob. You know, the fans loved Dale Earnhardt, and, and Dale Earnhardt loved the fans. And, and you know, this, this day, when he finally won the Daytona 500, didn't end until the wee hours of the morning. You see him, I mean, cherishing. He throws that monkey off his back in, up in the press box and uh, enjoying the moment. I mean, here's a man that's been coming to Daytona for two decades. And how about the, the, the hug there from Bill Francis? And no one, uh, although he loves all his drivers, I mean, he obviously is a big, big fan of Bill Earnhardt. You know, three hours or so after this, all this has taken place, we were there doing Sports Center at a studio along Pitt Road. And it was pitch dark, and you see Earnhardt riding on the back of that motorcycle. Well, three hours later, as the hot dog wrappers are blowing around and just the seagulls are there, we hear a lone motorcycle pull up to our studio. Uh, in the wee hours of the morning, and it's Earnhardt still on the back of that motorcycle with his hat in one hand and a glass of champagne on the other saying, I won the Daytona 500. I mean, still savoring what he waited 20 years for. And then, Doc, there's a story about the good luck charm that Dale carried in the car. Earlier in that week, he was very upset that his race car wasn't running very well. After practice, he was taken over to meet, uh, you know, some Make-A-Wish children. And a young child leaned over, and, and Dale gave this child a hug, and, and the child just lit up. And, and Dale said, how can I be so upset when this child is so excited and has been dealt this set of cards? Well, after that meeting, the child gave Dale Earnhardt that penny, which he ran over and put some little 3M glue on and put in his car. And that penny, he said, was my lucky penny that allowed him to win the Daytona 500. A lot of emotion that day. A lot of emotion, Bob. Later in our show, we will have a very special encore in Dale's own words, his 1994 championship thank you from the NASCAR banquet in New York. Hi, I'm Charlie Steiner. Dale Earnhardt's death in Sunday's Daytona 500 has turned out to be one of the most tragic moments in sports history. The ESPN Classic will present a special 12-hour tribute to Earnhardt this Saturday, beginning at noon Eastern time. Joining me will be many of ESPN's auto racing reporters as we look back on the life and impact on one of the greatest drivers and sportsmen in American history. ESPN Classic remembers Dale Earnhardt this Saturday at noon Eastern time. Before I go any further, um, I'd like to recognize the man who never, never let up on his efforts to win his eighth championship. Dale Earnhardt is a true competitor and a great champion. And at this time, I would like to offer a toast to the man. Dale, great effort, man. Here's some milk. Toast by Jeff Gordon at the 1995 banquet, I think, showed that he had respect, and in fact, every driver had respect for Dale Earnhardt. But there was the moniker of the Intimidator, and there are a couple <laughs> of incidents that come to my mind, Jerry, and both of them are at Bristol, not surprisingly. One of them was in 1995, and there is an incident between Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace that sent Rusty around. And NASCAR decided to put him in the penalty box. He was sent to the back of the field. But Earnhardt's fans swore <laughs> Rusty backed into him. But anyway, this is what happened. Earnhardt is, is black flag, sits still on the racetrack. The entire field goes by. 120,000 fans were real happy about it. But guess what? Earnhardt wasn't happy either. And it just built a fire in him because he made his way up through the uh, field taking prisoners as he went along, but nevertheless, at the end of the race, he was once again in a position to perhaps win. Very gingerly taking care of the front <laughs> of his car, making sure he didn't bump anyone until he got to the guy who was leading the race on the white flag, Terry Labonte. And there is Labonte into the wall as he crossed the line, and Terry Labonte brought into victory lane perhaps the most messed up car in the history of NASCAR Winston Cup Auto Racing. But he was the winner, and... Perhaps in 1999 then, there was uh, more thoughts like that going through people's minds as once again it was Terry Labonte and Dale Earnhardt battling for the championship Texas of that race. Texas Terry back at uh, Bristol on a Saturday night under the lights and Earnhardt chomping at the bit. Who can ever forget those final lap and, lap and a half? Well, this is in turn one and two as they head down again uh, at the final lap of the race. There's the touch by Dale Earnhardt. Labonte goes around. This time he's into the wall, but it's on the backstretch. And that 
results in Dale Earnhardt going on to win the race. And this is why they have so many seats. This is why they put 150,000 people in this bull ring in the mountains of Tennessee, because they see this kind of action and this kind of incredible history of the intimidator in victory lane once again. But you know, Jerry, there were times when uh, Dale Earnhardt could also have fun with situations like that. No one was immune, as we saw in last Friday's IROC race at Daytona International Speedway. Now that's Earnhardt leading the race in the green car. Here comes Eddie Cheever in silver up along the outside. And as they race down into turn number one, Cheever forces Earnhardt off the track and into the grass. And Bob, he never lifts 180 miles an hour in the grass. Unbelievable. And he saves this race car. Now you know why six of his 11 IROC wins have come at this racetrack. This is incredible. Through the grass to the flat part of the racetrack and then up into the banking and still Earnhardt didn't lose it. The payback came on the cool down lap as Cheever was spun by Earnhardt on the backstretch. They had a bit of a confrontation in the pit area. I never hit a man in a car. I owe you an apology. I never hit a man in a car. I owe you an apology. What side? We are. I ain't okay. Well, we heard that, but Doc, but what was really said down there? Well, Earnhardt went up to Cheever and he said, you know, he said, I'm not mad. He said, just don't do it again. He said, but what you need to know is I'll race with you anytime. He gave him a bit of a hug and walked away. That was classic Earnhardt. Well, Jerry, in May of 1998, ESPN celebrated NASCAR's 50th anniversary with a star-studded Hollywood gala. Along with former champions Herb Thomas, Richard Petty, Cale Yarborough, and Darrell Waltrip, Dale was named as driver of the 1990s decade. His good friend, James Garner, did the honors. The most calculating driver in NASCAR history, this intimidator is thundering through the 90s with four more NASCAR Winston Cup championships, bringing his total to seven with 71 overall career wins. But no win tasted sweeter than his recent victory this year's Daytona 500, Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Five of the greatest stock car races of all time, the NASCAR drivers of the decade. In every major sport, there are key moments and prime figures that either build, transform, and for an elite few, transcend their profession. And Benny Parsons, for those of us that knew the sport in the 1980s, we saw a hot prospect, and he turned out to be one tough customer. Bob, in the early 80s, it seemed like that the drivers had to be more and more polished, able to speak, get in front of crowds, and say some nice words. When Wrangler announced they were going to sponsor Dale Earnhardt, I said, Earnhardt can't pull this off. He can't get in front of all these people and make all these big speeches. But Wrangler's marketing company came up with the greatest line I've ever heard. One tough customer. That fit Dale Earnhardt to a T. And for years, there was Wrangler colors, blue and, and yellow colors with Dale Earnhardt. Everyone knew that was a car to beat, and he was one tough customer. And then children signed GM Goodwrench. They paint the car black, tint the windows, and Earnhardt slinks down in that slinks down in that seat with the dark goggles. He just continued their persona. He was one tough customer. The Intimidator, all those things that you talk about Earnhardt, they fit him to a T. In spite of all the spoils that Dale's success brought him, his allure with the fans never wavered. They knew where he came from. He was grassroots, and he never forgot it. Coming up through life and working hard to get to where I am, I've, I've worked like everybody else has I've, at Great Dane Trailer, at uh, Coval Insulation. I've done insulating work, and welding work, front end alignment, brake work. I've done a, a lot of things in my time before I started racing to get to where I'm at. And uh, I think I can relate with that guy that's up in there and just paid and bought that ticket and he's worked at, at the front end shop or welded all week to you know, save his money and come to the race. Uh, I value his uh, support, his friendship, uh, his support of NASCAR. He may not be a Dale Earnhardt fan, but I still, I still like him. I appreciate him being there.
asked Dale Earnhardt what his favorite thing to do besides racing was, and he'd probably say hunting and fishing. He spent many an afternoon just relaxing and having fun with fellow outdoorsmen, including the late Neil Bonnet. <laughs> Earnhardt was even intimidating in the boat. It's very <laughs> ironic that those two were such good friends. They died at the same racetrack. And Dale was to have inducted Neil into the International Motorsports Hall of Fame this May. You know, when we lost Neil Bonnet at that racetrack in February 1994, Dale Earnhardt took it very, very, very hardly. We went, he went to the boat that night and sat and stared up in the sky. And, and for probably 18 months, there was an emptiness inside him because he missed his closest friend. It was Neil Bonnet. And we sat a lot of times together and talked about how much we both missed Neil and how, how we just had to go on with life and the, I remember we were in the, in the Bahamas fishing one time and uh, Dale and Teresa and myself and Michael and Buffy Walter were there and we were out fishing all day on the boat and we came back that night and, and Dale said, you know, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's take a ride on a bicycle. Let's go, let's go for a talk. And so uh, we grabbed a bicycle, we're riding along the beach and I looked up and he's riding backwards, sitting up on the handlebars, pedaling backwards. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I always ride this way so I can talk with Taylor when we're riding. And I said, I know what's going to happen. You're going to fall off and break your arm, and they're going to blame me. And he said, oh, don't worry about it, Doc. You're the doctor. You can fix it. We rode up the beach to the end of the beach there, and as the sun was setting, we had another one of our long chats, which I'm going to miss. But uh, we talked a lot about how much we both missed Neil Bonnet and, uh, and wished he was here. Jerry, tell me of the story of the autograph seeker in Ohio. Dale was at a dealership in Ohio signing autographs. He was supposed to be there about an hour, and he'd been there two hours. He didn't want to leave. These people had been there all morning, standing in line in the cold. And the people with him said, you know, Dale, well, you got to go. you got to be at a test session. So rather than just leave these people outside in the cold, he walked outside of the dealership through the showroom and began to go by and just high-five people on the way out. As he's walking down this line, he notices a lady who sort of stooped over, uh, maybe 25 years of age, and he thinks she's sick. He walks up to her and says, uh, are you okay? And he leans down, and she's panting. He says, are you in labor? And she says, no, I don't think so. I think I'm just having a few contractions. And she says, what are you doing here? She says, well, my, I read in the paper you were going to be here today. My husband's a huge Dale Earnhardt fan. And I wanted to come get in line and get your autograph and surprise him tonight. Dale just shook his head, took his hat off, put it on her, took his leather coat off, put it around her and said, uh, you go home and give these to your husband. And by the way, if it's a boy, Dale's not a bad name. That's the type of story I'll remember Dale Earnhardt for. Me too. Dale loved North Carolina. Even dearer to him were the residents of his hometown of Kannapolis. Every day someone was touched either directly or indirectly by a kindness spawned by Dale Earnhardt. So it's fitting that the family has requested any donations be made to the Foundation for the Carolinas, Post Office Box 34769, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28234-4769. This foundation has been serving the area's philanthropic needs for over 40 years and is the largest community foundation in the Carolinas. The phone number is 704-376-9541. of being a champion is playing hurt. After a violent crash at Talladega in July of 1996, Dale Earnhardt showed up at Indy to defend his Brickyard 400 title. And then we witnessed something else that was hurting, his pride. Benny Parsons rejoins us from Daytona Beach. You know, Bob, I'd watched Dale Earnhardt race for, what, 15 years. When it was 100 degrees, 30 degrees, every condition in the world, Dale Earnhardt had never gotten out of the race car because that's, he prided himself in being able to stay in that car and drive that baby. At the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, he was hurting too much. He could not continue on. He had to get out of the car. And we saw in his eyes and we heard in his voice just how much that hurt him. His pride to have to get out of that race car. We knew he was in pain, but Jerry, we really didn't know how much pain he was in. Benny, we never told anyone how much Dale Earnhardt was hurting. We never told anyone how seriously he was injured. But folks, we can tell you now, his sternum was broken and overlapping about a half an inch. That's the breastbone here in the front. His left clavicle, his left collarbone was broken right at the sternum and separated. When we put him in the race car and pulled those belts down, I cringed. We watched those bone fragments move, putting him in the car. He ran six laps at Indianapolis, and when he climbed out of the car, we saw a very different Dale Earnhardt. I know that's probably the toughest thing you've had to do is climbing out of that race car. Yeah, it, uh, the car is real comfortable, and I, I wasn't in much pain riding along there, but 
you know, the plan was to get him in there so just in case anything happened, it wouldn't hurt myself anymore. And Dad gum is hard to get out of there, Jerry. It just, it's, I mean, you know, that's just my life right here. Boy, an emotional deal, Earnhardt. You will never see that. This man loves and lives to race. And then the next week was at Watkins Glen, and the troops were assembled, including you, Jerry, to talk about what they should do. On the morning of qualifying, Bob, we met in the motorhome, and Dale was there, and Teresa, and Richard Childress, and David Smith, and all of us. We were trying to convince Dale not to drive the car. We were telling him, look, you, you need time to heal. Let this heal. You got out of the car last week, and just give it up this week. And Dale said no. We could see in his eyes, because of what had happened the week before at Indianapolis, there was no way he was going to get out of the car. So we tried a different tack. said, okay, Dale, you can't do the job. You know he's the ultimate team player. You can't get it done. You're at a road course. You're driving with one arm. You've got to shift 18 times and grab the steering wheel. You can't do it. And we made the challenge to Dale Earnhardt. He couldn't get it done. And here's what happened in qualifying. Well, at the butt at the Glen, Dale Earnhardt won the pole position. And we knew he was ready to race once again. A brand new track record, one-handed <laughs> on a road course at Watkins Glen. Incredible. When we return to our special look at the life of Dale Earnhardt, we'll remember a race that was one in a million. I think that's what it is. It just wears you out having that three car in the rear view mirror. He's everywhere. Where will this guy turn up next? Ready one, take one, roll A, up on A. Ready to fade to black and roll X. Happy 15th anniversary, ESPN. Roll X. <laughs> he could do it all on the racetrack and in the TV truck. Absolutely. Racetrack, victory lane, television truck. I mean, on a Sunday afternoon, Earnhardt had that magic. He could disappear and reappear just about anywhere. <laughs> well, when the checkered flag fell on last October's Talladega race, Dale Earnhardt tasted what would be his final NASCAR Winston Cup victory. Many fans and journalists not only think it was the greatest race ever, but the finest display of Earnhardt's God-given talent. From the broadcast booth, our Benny Parsons watched in awe. You know, Bob, if there was ever any doubt that Dale Earnhardt was the master of the super speedways, Daytona and Talladega, if there's ever any doubt, he put it all to rest back in October at Talladega. Unbelievable. 49 lead changes. Race cars all over the racetrack, three and four wide. With about four or five laps to go, I looked on the monitor in the booth and saw Earnhardt was back in 18th spot, and I discounted him. I said, Earnhardt will not win today. A couple of laps later, I looked up, and he was running fourth. And I think I said on there, where did he come from? I still have no idea how Earnhardt was able to do that. But I know the fans went nuts. You could hear the fans screaming above the race cars, screaming Dale Earnhardt on the victory. And he didn't disappoint him. He came on to victory lane. And he was racing for a fan that day. Remember the Winston No Bull Five? Richard Sturz was there. Earnhardt was representing him. And in victory lane, when Richard came up and got on the race car with Dale Earnhardt, I think that Earnhardt was as happy for him as he was himself winning the race at Talladega. He loved doing something for the fans. And Richard Sturz was on my radio show the next night on Monday night with Dale Earnhardt. And he said he was going to come down and buy a truck from Earnhardt Chevrolet dealership in Newton, North Carolina. Earnhardt said, Richard, you better save that money. You might need it one of these days. Invest that money. Earnhardt still trying to help that fan the next day. Oh, man, what a race that Talladega race was, Bob. <laughs> It was an incredible race, and that victory really kept him in the thick of the points battle that year. Bob, I was so tickled that you were preoccupied with the Indy Racing <laughs> League event that day, and I got to call that race. I hate you weren't there with us, but I got to call that race, and that's a memory I will have for a long, long time. I mean, race fans have long known that until the checkered flag waves, Earnhardt is not out of it. And as Benny said, you know, where did he come from? When that race was over, Benny and I were on our way to the airport, and I remember we were talking about, you know, what we saw just a few minutes ago was not humanly possible. Then I stopped and said, you know, this guy's not human. He's Earnhardt. But he hated restrictor plate races, and Talladega was one of his strongest racetracks. It was, and, and you know, I think that, you know, Earnhardt's the kind of guy said, tie me in the car, let's go 235 miles an hour, put the pedal to the floor, and if it's too fast for you, go sit in the stands and watch it. I mean, that's <laughs> the kind of guy Earnhardt was. But, uh, but uh, he was so good on those racetracks because he was so focused and fearless. Well, racing was the only way of life Earnhardt ever knew. When we come back, we'll look at the legacy he fathered. In 1998, Dale Earnhardt Jr. became his dad's full-time Bush Series driver. 
and the youngster claimed the first of two back-to-back -back titles for his proud father. What can you say about a driver that uh, is your son? Um, not just a proud owner, but uh, a proud papa too. And uh, I don't think a father could be any happier to be uh, uh, be his dad and uh, his owner too. But uh, very proud of your son. He you did it. And dad, as a driver for your race cars, I want to thank you for putting together a championship race team. You know what it's like to be a championship owner. And as a son, I want to thank you for being a championship father. Dale Earnhardt Jr. won the championship in 1998, and I remember a very special open to the 98 Bush race at Homestead that you were involved in. Benny and I were doing the race at Homestead, and we knew that Dale Jr. was going to lock it up by just starting the race, and uh, Dale Sr. said he would join us in the booth for the opening of that show. And he stood beside Benny and I, and we watched him. We watched Ned Jarrett watch his son over the years with, with so much pride. And now we're watching Dale Sr. watch his son become a champion in NASCAR. And, uh, and when that race began and we went on the air, I remember just seeing the moisture fill in his eyes. And, and, and you realize this is, this, is, this is the intimidator, but right now he's a proud, proud father. Of a, of a championship son. So much of the attention has been focused on little E, if you will, since the death, but let's not forget about the other three Earnhardt children. Well, the other two older children, we're talking about uh, Carrie is the oldest, and of course he had a racing career early on in the short tracks, but decided to put his career on hold and start a family and, uh, and get into the business world a little bit. And now recently he has gotten back into racing and shown some of his talents in, in ARCA and Bush competition. Kelly, the, the, the second child, uh, uh, the other girl, she probably was the best short track racer of the three of them, between Kerry, Kelly, and Dale Jr., but she went into the business world and, uh, and has been very, very successful and uh, is, is certainly a, a point of pride for, for, for Dale Sr. and the family. And of course, Little E, we, we talked about what he's done. And, and, then, uh, and then the youngest member, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's Taylor and Nicole. Uh, as we were talking about, it's hard to believe she's 12 years old. I mean, Bob, right after she was born, Dale Earnhardt was at Charlotte in a practice session. And the day was over, and he got some of the NASCAR officials in one of the vans and went around the racetrack. They thought they were going to be chewed out about something about the racetrack, about the turn or the, the wall. And, and he went over to the, to the turn, and he got them out of the vans, and he pointed up to the sky and said, look up there. And, and up there in one of the condos in front of the windows stood Teresa holding Taylor. And Dale looked up and said, see there, guys? That's what it's all about. I mean, how much more tender a moment can you have? We certainly will miss uh, Taylor and uh, Teresa's presence in those victory lanes with Dale. One of the first things I heard you talk about uh, when we learned of the death was your ideas concerning the last lap and uh, the fact that uh, <coughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Michael Waltrip were gone. Well, you know, I, a lot of us know that Dale Earnhardt always wanted to win. Uh, and, and he would do whatever it took on the racetrack for him to win. I firmly believe, and from talking to some of the other drivers yesterday, they believe that Dale Earnhardt could have made a move on that last lap and maybe had Sterling Marlin or Kenny Schrader draft with him and go by little, little Dale or, or, or Michael. But it didn't happen. What he did is what a father would do for a son or what a brother would do for a brother. And ironically, his son and someone who was like a younger brother to him, Michael Walter, for the two cars in front of him, he said, you guys go ahead, I'll hold them off. It's like the old war movies where you say, guys, you, you guys make a run for it. I'll stay here in the foxhole and hold them off. And he held them off, and Michael Waltrip won, and Dale Jr. finished second. There was certainly no selfishness displayed in that act. Not at all. Well, just over two weeks ago, Dale and Dale Jr. were truly teammates as the pair drove in the Rolex 24 Hours at Daytona. Corvette Racing welcomed the two Oval Meisters to the world of endurance road racing. Even at 3 a.m., according to Dale, it was a kick in the pants. They finished fourth overall and second in their class. And fittingly, they celebrated in Victory Lane together.
Linda's loving images of Dale, Teresa, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. are the last ones together as a family. And it's the way we choose to remember. For his final thoughts, we return to Benny Parsons in Daytona Beach. Bob, when I was driving a race car, I told all my close friends, if something happens to me when I'm in that race car, please don't feel sorry for me because I know what I'm doing and I know that I could pay the supreme price, but it's what I want to do, be inside that race car. And I think that's exactly what Dale Earnhardt wanted to do, was be inside that race car, trying to beat those other guys. And look where racing took him to sitting beside presidents and kings and staying in the presidential suite of the Waldorf Astoria, one of the most famous hotels in the country, only because of racing. But, you know, I, I think that if Earnhardt had known how much that we're going to miss him, I'm talking about us, the media, uh, his friends, the other drivers, and especially the fans, maybe Earnhardt would have sat down in a chair beside of me and talked to you and said, okay, don't worry about it, folks. Don't worry about it because I'd rather live 49 years the way I have than 100 years of mediocrity. Well said, BP, and uh, a very good thought also. Jerry, I know this is going to be really tough for you, but uh, you had a very special place in your heart for Dale Earnhardt. You know, Bob, they can take away our champion, but they can't take away our memories. In 1994, at the NASCAR Awards Banquet, when it was all over, I had a chance to stand on that stage between two seven-time Winston Cup champions, the King Richard Petty and the Intimidator Dale Earnhardt. Now, Richard Petty won 200 races, and he was one of my heroes. But in my opinion, in the modern era of motorsports, no one was better than Dale Earnhardt. He was the best of the best. And I know what you're saying out there. I said, they're saying, Doc, tell them how we feel. You know, he left us doing what he loved, but it doesn't make it any easier. We're going to miss him. He was a champion. He was the intimidator, and he was the best. Jerry, thank you very much. Well, prior to the banquet honoring Dale Earnhardt as a seven-time NASCAR Winston Cup champion, we offered him the opportunity to write and produce his own tribute for this special occasion. It was a challenge he accepted with his usual competitive spirit. He opened up and talked about his past in a way that few had heard before. He brought out personal family photos and dug deep to reveal the pride that he had in his roots. He wanted to remember everyone that had made him a champion. All he wanted to do was to say thanks. It's great being from Kannapolis, North Carolina. It's the kind of hometown that everybody wishes they had. I'm proud to say that I was born to Ralph and Martha Earnhardt as the third of five children. I think you all know my daddy as a racer. And because of him, it's all I ever wanted to be. My sisters Kay and Kathy and brothers Randy and Danny, they've all meant a lot to me through the years with the support they've always given. My mom is my biggest fan, and I'm glad she's had the chance to share a lot of the good times with me. I want to say thanks to all my family, friends, and business associates in the Carolinas and all over that have supported me in the good times and bad. People you may not have heard of that have really helped me in the past, people like Jimmy Otten at Piedmont Bank, who helped me with 90-day notes to keep me racing when my pockets were empty. Growing up, I thought we were rich because I was always around race cars. I got a lot of hands-on experience with my dad, how to work on cars, and what it took to win. I love going to the races with my dad, or working with racers like Haywood Plyler. I think I was Haywood's first crew chief. I would do the windshield and roll tires around the car, whatever. The early years were pretty exciting, pretty scary, and pretty unbelievable at times. David and Ray Oliver owned the first car I drove. A little bit embarrassed that it was pink, but I had a good time driving it. Next, I drove an old 56 Ford that James Miller on. During the winter, James and the guys built a 63 Falcon. Can you believe we won the first race we ran it? My next car owners was Tommy and James and Frank Russell from Concord, North Carolina. I know we won over 26 races the first year, and I think 29 or more the second year. All my racing back then was on dirt. While I was still running the six-cylinder class, Pete Hamilton, Tex Powell, Larry Rathgaff, and the Petties gave me a chance to test the Chrysler kit car in Concord, North Carolina. Boy, you talking about an experience, getting out of a six-cylinder into a V8. Now, that was some fun. After my dad passed away, I was fortunate to have a good friend, Gray London, who bought me my first asphalt car. It was a 65 Chevelle from Harry Gant. 1974 was my first asphalt race, and I've got to thank Harry Gant and Tommy Houston for teaching me the difference between dirt and asphalt. That was some experience. Bobby Isaac also meant a lot to me in those days. He gave me some great advice. 
I gotta thank Ned Jarrett, who was the promoter at Hickory Speedway in those days. He helped me with finding sponsors. One of my first sponsors was Doc Cycle Center of Kannapolis, which was owned by Marshall Brooks, a good friend of mine. And boy, was he a lot of fun. My first super speedway race came when Richard Howard of Charlotte Motor Speedway helped me get a ride with Neil Castles in the Sportsman 300 in October of 1974. I kept racing the short tracks in the Sportsman division with the help of friends like Gary Hargett. In May of 1975, I made my first Winston Cup start. I drove an Edna Grease Dodge in the World 600. Boy, what an experience. About that same time, Robert G. built a Camaro that we raced at Concord and some other short tracks around there. Boy, it was awesome. We won a lot of races with that car. I'm grateful to Robert for all the help he gave me from driving his dirt car to winning Daytona, Charlotte, Rockingham, and his sportsman cars. Robert really meant a lot to me, as well as a lot of other people in racing. When times were tight, there was a lot of people that believed in me. I've got to thank people like Dick Hutchinson and Eddie Pagan for, well, letting me charge too much on my parts bill that I finally paid off. In May of 1976, I drove a car owned by Walter Ballard at Charlotte for my second Winston Cup start. Then in November, I drove Johnny Ray's car at Atlanta with Buddy Parrott as my crew chief. Boy, I got in a heck of a wreck over in turn three with Dick Brooks and demolished the car. I got a break in 1978 thanks to Humpy Wheeler who put me in a Will Cronkite car at Charlotte, the World 600. I ran three more races with Will before I met Rod Osterlin. Rod let me drive his sportsman car at Charlotte and his Winston Cup car at Atlanta, where I finished fourth in just my ninth Winston Cup start. With the support of Rod Osterlin and the whole Osterlin team, I was on my way. 1979 was a great year. I won my first Winston Cup race at Bristol, and I won the rookie of the year. We had a good crew with guys like Doug Richard, Jake Elder, Dave D'Ambrosio, and Lou LaRosa. It's hard to believe the next year we won our first Winston Cup championship. In 1981, I made the decision to change rides, and Junior Johnson was instrumental in helping me team up with Richard Childers. Richard and I both appreciate Junior's advice. Then in 1982, I had the opportunity to drive for a great man, Bud Moore. We won some races, but more importantly, Bud helped me settle down. I'll always be grateful to Bud. So many people helped me in my career for no other reason except they loved to race and they believed in me. I really appreciate people like Mike Herman, Ronnie Sellers, Gene Dees, Mike Watkins, Woody Chavis, Robert G. Jr., Rick Bregman, Rick Boss, Don Drake, Mark McCullen, my brothers Randy and Danny, Tony Urey, and Donnie Reeves. Of course, I've got to remember my old buddy Joe Whitlock. He taught me there's more to this sport than just driving a race car, and he kept me really amused with great stories about my dad. In 1984, I went back to drive for Richard Childers. He had put together a strong team that has a lot of the same people that make up the team today. The Childers team won four pit crew championships in a row from 1985 through 88 with guys like Kurt Shammerdine, Will Lynn, David Smith, and Chocolate Myers. Together we won NASCAR Winston Cup championships in 86 and 87 in Chevrolet Monte Carlos for Wrangler. Jim Goodrich came along in 1988 and with their support, we've won four Winston Cup championships in the past five years in our Chevy Luminous. Through it all, Richard Childers has given me the best. The best crew, the best cars, and the best advice and friendship that any man could ask for. Throughout my career, I've made some great racing friends. Men I've learned from. Men like David Pearson, Kel Yarborough, Benny Parsons, Donnie and Bobby Allison, Richard Petty, and Dave Marcus. Of course, we've had some sad times. We've lost some great guys that I love to race with. Guys like Tim Richmond, Davey Allison, and Alan Kowicki. They were more than competitors to me. They were our friends. Then there's all the other characters I'm still racing with. Rusty, Ernie, Mark, Schrader, Kyle, Jeff Gordon, and all the other guys out there. You are the ones who make NASCAR Winston Cup racing so competitive. There are personal friends and fans who have encouraged me more than they'll ever know. I've got to make a special point to thank Bill France and the whole NASCAR family. They do more than most will ever know to give us a great organization to race with. Thanks to the folks at RJ Reynolds, T. Wayne, Jim Johnson, and all the others through the years that have made this sport grow in a way that just is unbelievable. I've walked away with a lot of their checks and I really appreciate Winston. Thanks also to the promoters, the press people, just everyone involved who has helped me become a seven-time champion.
I know where the support has come from, and I know without everybody's help, I wouldn't be where I am tonight. I'm fortunate to have a great family. My children, Carrie, Kelly, Dale Jr., and Taylor Nicole have given me a lot of joy. I want all of them to know how proud I am of them. I don't know how far we could have gotten without Teresa. She's been just a great wife and a friend to me. Of all the good things that have happened to me, Teresa has been the best. I couldn't close without a thanks to Neil. A man couldn't ask for a better friend. He was with me and the whole team this past season. He was in our thoughts and in our hearts. Nobody will ever know how much Neil Bonnet has helped me in my life. I just wish I had the chance to thank him. With the help of the good Lord and a lot of good people, I made the journey from the old dirt tracks around Kannapolis to the greatest super speedways in the world. And tonight, while you may be honoring me as your seven-time champion, I'm here to say it's me, Dale Earnhardt, who honors you and thanks you. We will always remember Dale Earnhardt as a champion in every facet of life. His passing has brought much sorrow, but his life brought millions great joy. Godspeed, Dale Earnhardt. It's my life. It's better left to chance I could have missed the pain